<laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the CS Education Zoo. We're on our second episode. We're very excited to be back. Uh, I'm here with my co-host Will Bird, and he's going to introduce our special guest for today. So, Will. Hello. Welcome to the second episode. Today's guest is Rob Simmons, who is a friend of mine from Carnegie Mellon University, and he's been involved for the last couple of years in teaching uh, a, some really exciting new courses and, and revamping the intro course at. Carnegie Mellon, which, as you might know, is one of the best computer science schools in the world. And they're doing some really cool stuff, especially with teaching imperative programming, which is you know, kind of interesting because CMU, from a programming language standpoint, is known as a, a hotbed of functional programming languages. So it's curious to find out how they teach imperative programming without you know having to hold their nose because it's, you know <laughs> a functional programmers, you know, when you start talking about imperative stuff and side effects, they start getting antsy. So uh, without further ado, here is my friend Rob. Hello, uh, and thank you. I'm, uh, I'm excited and uh, 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 humbled and nervous and uh, uh, to, to, be on, uh, to be on this program. I guess you, um, you uh, su uh, suggested I start with a little bit of background about myself. Um, I uh, was a undergraduate at Princeton University and um, about um, in my sophomore year, Andrew Appel, who's faculty at uh, Princeton University, sent an email to the CS undergrad saying, if you're um, a student that started out taking some advanced math courses but decided, no, I think I'll go with computer science, you should take this course on automated theorem proving. Um, and that course led to a research project, which led to another research project with David Walker. And that was what set me along the the, the path at, um, um, to end up at grad school at Carnegie Mellon. And then at grad school at Carnegie Mellon, I uh, worked a lot on um, the uh, uh, pr uh, logical frameworks for specifying um, both functional programming languages but also uh, imperative programming languages, which was one of the ways that I uh, ended up in the course that I'm teaching now. And um, once I was done uh, with my... PhD, uh, they uh, offered um, a postdoc, which they've uh, done uh, for a number of uh, Carnegie Mellon graduate students um, to get a little bit more experience in teaching uh, in a postdoc situation before we headed into the world. And um, for me, I got a little bit more experience teaching and then decided not to head out into the world. And they decided they uh, would uh, like having me around. And I. Um, enjoy Pittsburgh very much and so decided to stay. So that's where I got to where I am now. Can, can you uh, talk a little more about the, the postdoc and the teaching? Because it, you know, that seems unusual to me because I've done a couple postdocs now and, and the, most of those postdocs that I know of seem to be more research oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, so so can, you, can you talk about that and, and kind of how that came about and how that worked out? Is that, does that seem like a good idea that other, other schools should do? So it, it really it's an interesting um, it's an interesting postdoc. It's not a uh, it, like you say it's not the usual model. Um, in, in the years since I did it, they have somewhat tried to formalize the process um, as the uh, the Mark Stellick teaching postdoc. Um, I think an interesting well uh, maybe not that unusual aspect of Carnegie Mellon's um, PhD curriculum is that. For our PhDs, you have to TA twice as a graduate student um, to, in order to get a PhD in the computer science department. That's part of our education, but um, you may just TA twice. Um, I, as a grad student, really focused on the the research aspects of my PhD um, and didn't, you know, had a great experience teaching. Uh, TAing two courses early on in my uh, in my grad uh, school career, but as I was preparing to leave the PhD program, and I was thinking about well, you know, this idea of going and potentially looking for um, you know doing some more research, perhaps in a postdoc, but then looking for uh, possibly tenure track positions, which wasn't ultimately the route I decided to go. But the idea of possibly looking at a, teach, uh, a tenure track position and being in a position of, all right, now it's time to start 
you know, your research career and get your NSF career grant and start advising grad students. And by the way, here's 100 undergrads. Um, and you've TA'd twice. Struck me as really, really frightening. So I was very appreciative that, you know, as I was evaluating what my career path was, they had the option of um, staying on. And, you know, they do it strategically. They needed, um, you know, some help with one of the courses that they were teaching. And I was in a position, uh, the course that I'm now teaching, uh, Principles of Imperative Computation. Um, and, um, uh, but I was able to uh, uh, teach that course. It's a large lecture course. We had, I think, um, 275 students between two lectures the, when I first did it, and now it's even larger. Um, and it was, I was able to work under the mentorship of both my uh, PhD advisor, Frank Finning, and Tom Cortina, uh, who has been in CS education for decades, um, and was able to work with both of them for um, uh, for the first semester as really, you know, I finished my PhD and as I was working into to moving into this new role. I found that mentorship opportunity absolutely amazing um, and really, really helpful. Um, it was a big part, you know, the, the fact that I was able to, to do a real teaching of a large intro class as a, um, as a postdoc. I don't you know, I certainly wouldn't have ended up where I wa where I am now um, if I hadn't been able to grow into that role in that way. So, Very does cool. that, Steve? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's exactly uh, what we want to hear about. Okay, uh, Steve, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so you, you obviously you mentioned the imperative uh, computation course, and mm -hmm. a, a lot of universities have their CS1 course, their intro course in an imperative language. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've switched away from that recently, and I'm kind of curious what you see as the the key ideas that students need to struggle with uh, mm -hmm. when they when they look at imperative computing from the outside. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. The uh, so we talk about. Um, uh, the course is named Principles of Imperative uh, Computation. Really, it's in most other universities would be most closely identified with the Data Structures and Algorithms course, the first, uh, the course that's much like the one that um, Kim Vole was talking a lot about teaching last week. So it was, it, you know, we're uh, emphasizing um, data structures. We're emphasizing, the, however, uh, the aspects of data structures in the principles of imperative computation class that are um, uh, primarily data structures that act via mutation. So if you think about that, in place sort is one of these um, hash tables are really a, you know, a, 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 I mean, there are ways of doing functional hash tables, but they usually involve something like, um, you know, uh, uh, but frequently, one of the ways that you implement uh, functional hash tables is with benign effects. Um, and so we, we really do work on what are the data structures that are core to dealing with operating by mutation. Um, in fact, one of the things that we teach in the course is graphs. And I, I kind of decided the most recent iteration of the course um, that really the only reason we teach graphs is to explain union find. Because graphs, like we need to, we need to talk about. You know, graphs. We're teaching that because future courses are going to expect them to have seen, you know, adjacency matrix and uh, adjacency list representation of graphs. But um, it also is fantastic when we can get across this really cool idea of imperative computation, which is the the um, the union find uh, data structure. I think it's. Um, but you, you asked the question, what are the things that people um, struggle with? I, I think that um, the, the notion that, that uh, I found students struggling with the most, and especially we have one assignment that's always incredibly conceptually difficult um, for students because it involves both recursion and mutation. And so you have a function that's going to change the state of a data structure, and when it returns, it has to put it back in the same state. 
And that is really interesting to watch students um, slowly piece through what that means because it requires them to think about the recursive call as uh, I feel like it's it's in a different it's in a, it, there's something um, extra about what what's going on with the recursive call than uh, than students usually have to think about when they're working with um, um, uh, with, with functional programs. The other reason that these, you know, that this notion of thinking about what's, um, how do I restore the things that I've broken um, leads to a lot of the key ideas that go, it, the, the, that we uh, look at over and over in the course. Um, the idea of having invariants that are violated partially and then restored um, as the, and I think the, the core example of that is you've got a um, a heap data structure, a, a priority queue implemented as a heap. And for a while you have this data structure that is completely not a heap, but that because it's only violated in one place, you can keep fixing it, and eventually you'll get back to where you started. I think that that's the, 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 those uh, are things that we can very, very um, uh, nicely capture in the way that our course does reasoning about imperative programming, and that's maybe the next thing I should speak a little bit about. But um, there are other things about, well, you've got a function that's going to change the world, but it's got to put it back in the same place as when you started. Um, those are things that I've seen students really struggle with in, in, in an interesting way. But that's interesting. So, um, so let me see if I can summarize here. You talked about mm -hmm. Um, you talked about the idea of a data structures course is a good way to bring in imperative programming because data structures are a natural place where we gain a lot of traction from mutation. Um, mm -hmm. the, some the some data structures, right. Yeah. Um, and then also this idea that maybe a, a key way to think about mutation is to think in terms of invariance and the idea of breaking and fixing an invariant uh, mm -hmm. iteratively because that, that sort of gives you, it gives you a baseline of of a functional feel and mutation becomes small local deviations from that functional mm -hmm. feel instead of being jumping off into the, the deep end of reasoning about mutation. Absolutely, and I think that um, we the course is really designed, and, and, and so the unique thing about the course is that um, um, it it, that it's a data structures course, but it focuses on imperative data structures in particular. Uh, one of the reasons that we focus on imperative data structures in particular is there is a different course, um, and this is sort of the larger context of our curriculum, that uh, deals in um, parallel and functional data structures and handles those as a, uh, a, single, a single entity. Um, and so, you know, there's, there, there are these two threads of introductory computer science that are work in tandem in Carnegie Mellon. Um, I think one of the ways of, of saying it is that we like, you know, uh, in our course we really focus on quick sort because in place sort is cool. And we mentioned uh, merge sort, but we really focus on quick sort. And then there's the functional programming class that really emphasizes merge sort because merge sort's cool, and uh, and mentions quick sort. Um, and these are uh, you know these happen at the same place in the curriculum. So there you know a lot of other schools have the course where you start moving from thinking about programming to thinking about computer science, and we very much have um, two. And there's a functional programming course, but the the imperative programming course uh, is um, is is one that um, is the one that I've been more involved in. And absolutely, the entire goal of the course is to um, allow people to think about code in terms of contracts and invariants. Um, and we have um, a language that is uh, a C-like language that we've constructed for this course. It's called CNOT. But the, the, the core idea of this language, other than the fact that it doesn't have unbehind, 
undefined behaviors, and it's quite a bit smaller than C, um, and it has array bounds checking. But really, the thing that we have are uh, the, the, that makes it important for teaching the course is you can annotate functions with checked preconditions and checked postconditions and checked loop invariants that are, you know, you can annotate a loop with a loop invariant. It, it, it looks like a, um, a special form of a C comment. It's got the, um, I'm just going to draw this above my head. Uh, oh, I'm... So we've got preconditions that are written as these uh, comments that start with an at of uh, requires. And, but we also have uh, post conditions that can be written into the program and optionally checked at runtime. And then this For the way that we teach the course, absolutely a key idea for what it means to, to, to make imperative programming a tractable problem, that you've got to both describe what the data structure invariants of your full-scale data structure are so that whenever you enter or leave a, uh, the library interface of something like a hash table, you know that all of the, um, you know, Everything in the hash table, the hash table is, uh, if you do separate chaining, it's a, a bunch of buckets. Every bucket contains um, a bunch of distinct keys. The keys all have a hash value that says that they are where they're supposed to be. And, um, and it's these, uh, these invariants of the data structure that allow us to reason about, um, um, th that allow us to work with our code. At, at scale. And so that's sort of talking about the preconditions and the postconditions of saying that you're keeping your data structure invariants right. But then on a smaller scale, when you're in the middle of an algorithm or you're in the middle of a loop, you're searching through your array, um, you're, search, you're, um, you're sorting an array, or you're fixing up your heap in a, uh, in a heap insertion or heap deletion, then having checked loop invariants is a really powerful way of saying, all right, um, what does it mean to have code that is consistently staying correct over time? Um, the really cool thing about this from a mathematical perspective is that a loop invariant, a loop invariant is just a um, is just an induction hypothesis of the proof that the the program is correct um, uh, from a certain perspective. But because we're able to say, oh, these are statements that are in your code, they're checked at runtime we never actually talk about induction. They're actually, uh, we don't have as a, as a prerequisite the course that teaches induction for computer science. So we're, we're assuming very little other than the fact that students can um, write contracts, understand what it means for a contract to fail at runtime. Um, and with that, that becomes the basis of how we, we make um, imperative programming sort of a reasonable exercise. So this sort of feels like uh, Eiffel meets C. I, I think that, um, yeah, we are looking for, um, I, I can't unfortunately say, like, um, I don't have a thorough enough understanding of Eiffel for that, but there are a lot of work in these sorts of more specification-oriented languages. And uh, it, when uh, Frank Finning... Uh, Rob Arnold and uh, uh, William Lovis looked into the design of CNOT. They were looking at some of this other language, um, the, these other uh, language designs, and um, the work on contracts that's going on in a lot of different places. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so, so Kim Bull asked, or what said last time that she thought that teaching people how to do proofs seemed especially hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, can can you comment on that and your experiences or the C, sort of CMU experiences? With that? So uh, Kim talked about yeah I, I actually have been thinking a lot about um, what was effectively Kimball's uh, point, which is that you can allow people to you, you're teaching people to do proofs or, and to evaluate proofs and to read through proofs, but what you're really trying to do, I think, I'm paraphrasing her correctly, was to have people able to 
um, have a program on their own that doesn't have a proof yet and work through the proof that proof itself. And that's really difficult to automate. That's really difficult to teach students a, um, an algorithm for. And I think one of the things that I've been moving towards, and this is probably going to be a big give and take over the span of years, is that because we're teaching this course, in many cases, if, if CS freshmen come in with programming experience, then I'm teaching them the first semester of college. And so one of the, the decisions that we've kind of been moving towards iteratively is that we don't actually ask them to come up with new proofs on their own. Um, and that is to say that we don't ask them to synthesize loop invariants unless it's a, it's a program that is very much like the one that they've seen before. So if there is a loop invariant that says, oh, you know, the, the thing inside the loop is always positive and less than the upper bound, then we, you know, we teach that in class over and over, and so that's the sort of thing that we might ask them about on an exam. Maybe we'll go, you know, decrement the loop instead of incrementing the loop. Oh, wait, that showed up the wrong way on video. The, they'll, yeah, decrement instead of increment. There we go. Um, and, um, and so we, um, uh, we've got these, um, uh, w what I found is really important is the way that they, uh, the students know that a proof is wrong is much more important at the level that we're teaching them than them actually being able to come up with um, the new loop invariant on their own. And so this is actually, it's a little bit lower in the hierarchy of understanding to say here's a loop invariant um, of a loop. Um, either give me a, um, either explain why this loop invariant is preserved by every iteration of the loop, which is just a matter of symbol, like we're, we're teaching them to symbolically execute the loop body forward for one iteration and say if the loop invariant was true before, then how do we say that the loop invariant is true afterwards? So we're, we teach this notion of symbolically um, evaluating a loop to say that the loop invariant is always preserved, or we say, give an example of um, values that the assignable variables could be set to at the beginning of the loop, such that the loop invariant holds initially, the loop guard holds initially, and the next time we get to the loop invariant, it will evaluate to false. And there we're not asking a question that they identify as being uh, deep proof of, um, of correctness. We're asking them, like, you know, here's some code, break it. And that's the thing that's still very difficult for them to get. But I think that you, know, in, in, when talking about um, where I can expect most of the students to get to, being able to explain to them why a proof doesn't work in terms of an, a counterexample that you could run and that the program would fail because you would violate at runtime a loop invariant. And it would throw up a, oh, the loop invariant on this line evaluated defaults. That's, a, that's an incredibly um, useful artifact of being able to execute these contracts at runtime is what we're doing when we're teaching them to uh, reason about um, about code is we're teaching them to evaluate and create proofs, but we're asking them to create proofs usually once they already have a, um, a loop invariant. And then you're almost there because once they learn to be, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not confrontational, adversarial. Once they learn to be adversarial about their own statements of correctness, once they learn to say, oh, I think this is the reason that my code is correct, but if I'm wrong, why? Then now they're in the process of saying, okay, I've got a loop invariant that's wrong. I'm going to have to change it. Okay, now I have a loop invariant. Is it right or is it wrong? Can I move on from here? Or am I going to have to change that? So that that sets them off on the cycle of being able to iterate. 
in future courses um, with their proofs, but it, it, it makes it a much smaller question of, all right, I've got a proof, you know, is it, it, am, am I going to be able to come up with a, um, um, or I've, I've got a set of contracts, am I going to be able to come up with a proof that these are correct, or am I going to be able to come up with a counterexample that shows that I have a problem? Um, so, and, and in that, at that point, we're, reasoning, we're having them reason about, um, about proofs, but we're also having a conversation about testing, which is another big deal for um, students at this level. So, so you have these two courses that are at the same place in the curriculum, one with mm -hmm. the imperative programming and the other one with the functional and parallel data structures, is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. And can students take those in both orders? Or do they have to take one before the other? So let me draw a thing. So we've got, uh, the way our curriculum looks works is we've got a, just a programming course that we get students that are coming in, you know, starting from zero. Um, and then we have two courses that do descend off of that in either order. We've got my course, or the course that I've been primarily involved in, which is working with imperative programming. And then we've got another course that is working with functional programming. And yes, um, students can take the imperative programming and the functional programming course in either order. The reality is that they take them either imperative and then functional, or they take them at the same time. And the reason for that is that the functional programming course expects that they have finished the um, mathematics course called Concepts of Math, which is like induction, how do we reason about discrete math types of things. Um, and so because we have that as a co-requisite, they can take it at the same time, and the other course has it as a prerequisite. Uh, people have either gotten to where they take them imperative and then functional, or they've taken them uh, at the same time. It, it, it is meaningful, though, that they can take them at the same time, and a number of students do that every semester. Um, and then I, I was mentioning also there's the um, uh, the parallel data structures and algorithms course that um, that then has both my course, the uh, 122 uh, imperative programming, and the functional programming course as a prerequisite. And so you kind of go, you start, whoop, you start up here with like basic programming, and then you go down to working with imperative and functional programming as two ways of looking at the fundamentals of how we program as computer scientists, rather than how we program in order to, um, you know, uh, uh, programming as a mathematical discipline rather than programming as a um, um, as an activity. I actually don't know what the way I want to say. Uh, the difference between the view of programming that happens here and the view of programming that happens up here. Um, but then there are all these courses where, you know, we've got parallel data structures and algorithms. There's also a, an, a course that deals with object-oriented programming and programming in the very large, and that's a Java-based course. And though th that's another course that has both the imperative and the functional programming uh, courses as prerequisites. And then there's also, like, a bunch of math courses that live over here so that if you don't want to ever deal with imperative programming at all, you don't really have to. Um, not many people do that, but then there are a lot of people that are, you know, interested in hardware or they're electrical engineers and the systems programming track is all sort of over on this side where it relies on the imperative programming course without uh, um, expecting that people have done functional programming. Uh, well, thank, thank you for that overview. It's a um... It's interesting to see how it's structured. One, one thing that I think a lot of people have noticed teaching functional programming is that often the students who haven't programmed before seem to do better than the students who've been exposed to imperative programming. Mm -hmm. and I'm just curious about your experience with that. Obviously, you have a, a much more sort of rigorous um, approach to teaching imperative programming than most cases, mm -hmm. but do you see a difference between the folks who, who, who have... Uh, you know, who are taking the courses at the same time versus the people who take imperative first and that sort of thing? You know, is there any? Huh. 
Yeah, that's it's an interesting question. So, so the course that um, the introductory to program uh, the intro programming course is taught in um, in Python, and I think that Python has the quality of um, while being um, um, and uh, uh, the the students that are coming in that haven't programmed in C into to the imperative programming course are um, um, are I think a little bit more. Um, there, there are definite things that we have to teach them. So the idea of pointer structures and the idea of indirect reference and having a, um, a an array that's no longer a dictionary, it's now you know just a contiguous piece of memory, which is where uh, we're, uh, which is roughly the way we're looking at things. Having um, and pointers in particular. Um, that's not something that the, the students that have just done um, uh, Python have some ex have as much experience with. Whereas I think that students that have done C, C programming already, or they've been doing C++ programming, or they've even in certain cases if they've been doing Java programming, they have a little bit of a heads up there. And my experience is that the functional programming course is not um, doesn't have quite as much differentiation based on experience, and in fact has more differentiation based off of uh, mathematical sophistication um, coming in. Um, and I think that that's that's representative of the the, the ways that um, the the two courses are taught. I mean, I, I think that the um, when people are discussing starting. Uh, starting students on functional rather than imperative programming languages. If you're talking about just starting, then you're up here, uh, not down here. And so I think that like this course could be taught in a lot of languages besides Python, and it's mostly contingent that it's taught um, currently in Python. Um, um, uh, but but that's a um, but but it, it, it's up here that 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 the distinction I think you're talking about is really relevant. So I, I wonder if I can steal the conversation and go in a different direction, Will. Does that sound OK? Go, go for it. <clears throat> All right. So Rob, I will ask a selfish question. OK. I get a, I get a lot of students coming into my office, and uh, they're anxious about the exam that they just took. Um, you know, Maybe they're anxious because they got the grade back, or maybe they're anxious because they're just terrified uh, that they'll get the grade back. Uh, and they ask me what to do for the next exam. And honestly, uh, I think, uh, like a lot of us, um, I, I had a lot of us who are teaching CS, I had a, a relatively easy time compared to my students mm -hmm. uh, in my CS courses. So I do my best to give them some reasonable advice. But um, <clears throat> but I find this a really challenging situation. I was hoping you could, you could talk about what you do with <laughs> students in that situation. OK. Um, so I've. Um, this is something that, that, that I, when we were having a discussion about this beforehand, I said that I'd been thinking about a lot lately. But whew, I've been thinking a lot about it lately because um, it's a, it's because it's such a tough question, and I don't feel very. Um, uh, I, I think it's um, uh, potentially symptomatic of a larger problem that I don't know. Much of what the answer to that is, and that 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 um, you know that we can get a number of us in the room, and we really don't know how to actually um, approach this problem. Uh, I think that uh, because the the simple way in which we try to go about these, and I don't know if uh, if the places where you've been operate roughly the same way, but their practice exams and their solutions are exams from previous semesters, and those are posted online, and students can do those, and students can do them, um, um, and you know can check the solutions and compare those to their own answers. Um, and that is, in many ways, I think, where we stop. That's the best answer that a lot of us um, are, are able uh, are able to give, and um, that's a uh, um, well. I, I feel like there needs to be a better answer than that. It's a, it, 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 and it's a question that um, 
that, that has not on me a little bit lately as I taught this very uh, fast uh, six-week course that's usually a 15-week course. So rather than two lectures a week, it was five uh, lectures a week. Um, and so there was a, you know, there were students that were asking me this question. In that case, everything's moving at kind of blinding pace. And so if you, you wonder, um, you know, how can I encourage people to catch up, they really just need time to, they really might just need time to catch up a little bit. Um, I think one of the things that um, has, uh, um, you know, one of the things that we want to do ultimately with our curriculum is start using some um, online uh, posted tutorial style videos as a uh, not as the primary mode of delivery of the course but as an, another way that we're presenting the course as another mode for people to to gain some of the content and um, it may be the the that one of the ways of approaching this is to have more focused questions that um, that are uh, that are dealing with particular um, aspects of the, um, uh, the uh, so that uh, students don't feel like they have an enormous attack surface to hit on but um, honestly I'm uh, I'm lost. If other people want to uh, have thoughts that are in the hangout uh, I'd love to hear from them as well or from y'all I feel like I'm in, in very much the same situation as you in the sense that I, I think this is important and, and I have some things that I do, but I'm not totally confident about it. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to paste in a URL for uh, tomorrow's professor posting that I was, uh, I was looking at recently, which, which might uh, it, it kind of uh, crystallize my thoughts, and maybe we can post this on the website after, uh, after, the, uh, after the chat. Um, mm -hmm. And that that talks about these things called exam wrappers, which are basically just little um, little thought questions that they propose giving to students after the exam. And and part of those thought questions are how could you have prepared better? And they say, well, maybe you can take these these responses that students give and mm -hmm. you can hand them out to them two weeks before the next exam, and you can say, <laughs> you know. Last right. time you said maybe you should do this before the exam. Well, now. Here we are. It's two weeks before the exam. Maybe you should do this. Maybe you should do this. One of the other things that I have um, a, a very specific um, situation is that there have been a small number of students that have been performing quite well in the course, but have just been wrecking the exams. And they they were doing the work. They were trying. And a lot of cases, that's uh, a very uh, um, uh, one of the specific ways of dealing with those students is I've offered to proctor the exam for them in that I would be in my office for an hour and a half and they would sit down and they would take an exam. And I think that one of the reasons that that's useful is that um, sometimes students have um, uh, that, that are working through the exam on their own have a, it's kind of like how your blood pressure goes up when you're in the doctor's office, and maybe you, normally you're fine with your blood pressure. Um, that sometimes actually being in the setting helps them realize what's hurting them for the exam, but they're not focused on the fact, oh, I'm like I'm failing this exam right now. I'm failing this exam right now. I'm failing this exam right now. This exam that matters. It's that oh, okay, I, I realize that this feels really different than when I was not um, taking the exam when I was taking the exam in my own room. So that's part of what needs to, uh, that's part of the, the deal. And in certain cases, that's that's a real profound anxiety issue that we need to, to work with accommodating um, um, with the students that, that they're, they're perfectly able to do the exams, but they have anxiety that's preventing them from, from doing well, and so then there, there are steps that can be taken through our, uh, um, you know, on our own or through the disabilities uh, office at Carnegie Mellon that have helped a lot of people and have really turned, you know, students that were heading for C's in the class to students that were clearly getting A's in a class. Um, so that also seemed worth mentioning. 
So, Will, are, are we ready to start throwing open for q and I see we've got a, a question in the chat window from one of our audience. Yeah, why don't we see uh, what sort of questions people have? And so, so one question we have, um, I think it's, I think the name is Anas. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing it correctly. And the question is, Rob, I'm curious how student feedback may have affected your teaching style. Is there anything you stopped doing or continued doing based on student evaluation? If so, what impact did that have on student learning? Mm -hmm. So I think that um, one of the in this may be somewhat um, apparent from listening to me talk on a video. Um, I jump around a good bit in conversation. Um, and I've definitely gotten feedback about um, jumping around a bit in lecture. And I found that um, a way in which I've, I've tried to approach that is, again, instead of having a one-level outline of a lecture, I need to have like a five-level outline of a lecture so that I know what the conceptual dependency is. I, I can't say I always do this, but the, the lectures that I give and that I'm really happy with, I, I frequently um, do have a very detailed outline of not just where I, um, uh, of the order in which concepts need to be presented in, and of the different ways in which, based off of what student responses are, that that might get rearranged. And so frequently, you'll get a great question and that means that you have to skip forward or you'll get a great question and that means that you realize that you missed something a couple of steps back. Um, but the the classes that I've taught, we don't use um, slides as a primary mechanism at all. Um, we're working on the, the Blackboard and we're working in a coding session. Um, it, it's kind of a, um, a more improvisational um, improvisational style and I think that's important for the way that we teach the class of making sure that students stay um, stay engaged with what we're, we're talking about um, but I uh, you know the best uh, uh, good improv still has pretty structured plot lines uh, ahead of time it's the dialogue that is done um, you know sort of live and so I think that um, that there have been certain cases where, for the lectures, ooh, particularly lectures that involve drawing trees. Drawing trees are is in like a tree rotation. If you try to draw that with like an eraser, then the blackboard just ends up uniformly white. Um, and so there have been some uh, lectures where I've moved from um, uh, having the chalkboard for all of the lecture to having the chalkboard for this part of the lecture, but then rather than animating this diagram on a chalkboard, I animate that with an online demonstration or with a set of slides or with something like that. Because otherwise, I'm spending all my time erasing and making sure that things are thoroughly enough erased. And um, I jump around enough in conversation already that it's, uh, it, it's very helpful for me to have a little bit um, more structure. And, and it may be that as I continue to, to learn and grow, I'll be able to move back to that style that, like I said, you know, my mentors uh, I originally saw using, but, um, but I, I do try to remember that um, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the people that I originally saw teaching this class had uh, been respectively doing what they're doing for multiple decades, and I've been doing this for multiple semesters. That's very different. Um, so I think that that's, um, that's one example of just how I've, um, how I've, how uh, student feedback has affected my teaching, um, my teaching style. I think that um, Student feedback has also been very important as we take um, exercises and we turn those into what are the exercises that are the most helpful um, for helping students learn the, the, the learning objectives of, of the course that we're teaching. And so um, I think that the place where, where student feedback has had 
a really profound effect is if everyone is saying, oh, this assignment is particularly hard, or everyone is saying this assignment is particularly easy, that doesn't necessarily tell me that I need to make this, you know, that that doesn't necessarily directly give me what has to happen to the assignment, but that's really critical feedback in understanding um, um, where the what the role of those um, assignments inside the course is, and you know, maybe an assignment that's particularly easy, there can be uh, a twist that causes someone to look at it in a different way that they might not otherwise have. Um, and so I think that in terms of my overall teaching, um, I've found student feedback to be particularly critical in um, not just front of classroom assessment, but in terms of the larger picture of assessment and in what the assignments are and what the um, the even what the exam questions are. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? Uh, okay, Chris, did you have a question? Oh, sorry, there's an S. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, Let's see. Are there any uh, follow-up questions or? Um, yeah. I guess I, I guess for Anasa, I, I would be curious if you were asking particularly about lecture style or about sort of the larger the larger picture of what yeah, it means yeah. to be. Oh. Yeah, my question was general uh, for sure, but I think I was probably uh, focusing on lecture style. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a follow-up if no one else ha has a question. Um, how, how do you handle uh, feedback that that you're not sure about? That's common, but um, students just say it because it's it's inconvenient. How do you deal with feedback that you think is not really going to uh, improve your teaching or improve mm -hmm. the student learning? Um, how do you convince students that, um, or or do you or do you experiment a little bit if you're not sure? Like, how do you handle that? Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important for um, uh, for feedback that I mean it's been really difficult for me to get used to dealing with negative feedback. But oh, if you have a course with three hundred students, um, there's always there, there's going to be negative feedback, and that's uh, and that I mean you know that that took a good bit of growth as I started this and I, I knew that it wasn't like this was surprising like you know the first time I got teacher feedback it like you know I was like it was mostly positive and there were a couple of um, negative comments that I thought were really true and those hurt and there were a couple of negative comments that I thought weren't true and those really hurt um, but the question is uh, so um, I think that and, and then this maybe gets a heart of your question I, I've gotten good at I've gotten better at understanding and integrating the feedback that I think is correct. You know, you jump around in lecture a, a lot. Yes, and that's a thing that I need to be able to improve on. And it's also, uh, but it's also kind of a weakness of mine. And I need to, you know, and it's not something that I'm going to change overnight. And so those are those are things that are useful for me understanding sort of an honest assessment of myself. Then there are the, and actually I find that um, one of uh, the advice that I think is wrong about how to teach the course most frequently comes from my TAs. Because I'm teaching a, like I said, I think we're going to have 375 students in my course in the fall, two lectures. Um, and um, um, and so I'm going to have over 20 TAs that are going to be helping me teach this course. Um, and they have opinions. Oh, they have opinions. And a lot of them are absolutely fantastic opinions. Um, but sometimes I really do um, uh, uh, disagree with those, uh, w with, you know, what they think about how a various uh, part of the course can be run. I, I'm trying to think of a particular example. Maybe one will come to me, but I'm, I'm not thinking of it right now. Um, and um, but um, that the, that's usually easier feedback because I have the ability to have a discussion about it. And um, I, I think that if there's feedback that I disagree with that I can't form an argument for 
then um, then there's probably a problem. Even if I think it's wrong, I need to, um, uh, or even if I think it's it's not helpful or not um, uh, not particularly useful, I, I need to be able to know. I, I need to know how to address that concern. Because if a TA is bringing it to me, it's also probably occurred to 25 students that haven't mentioned it to me. Um, and, um, uh, but I mean, the, the critical part, I think, is really forming models of what the course is supposed to be doing um, and being able to, um, to say, that is um, a complaint that uh, to a certain degree may even indicate that the course is running as expected, that all is going according to plan. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm getting the complaints about the pointer assignment being too hard. All right, that's good. They figured out that pointers are difficult. And, um, and, and, that, and that that wasn't going to, that there are certain um, there are certain learning objectives that really do require people to struggle up against something and then recover. Um, and so I, I think that, um, yeah, it, it, especially in terms of, of, of TA feedback, it's, um, you know, it, it's important to have reasons, but it's also really okay for people to want to teach a course differently. I mean, one of the one of the nice things, and it's really the gift about uh, being in this set of students, is there are also a lot of really valid ways to get these students through the learning objectives that we want to teach them. And to a certain degree, all I'm trying to do is make sure that, you know, or the most important thing for me to do is make sure that I don't actively get in people's way and actively discourage people that would otherwise be great at this. Um, and so, that's also, there are multiple, you know, categories of that sort of feedback that I don't understand. And feedback that I don't understand that's saying, this just burnt me out and I don't think there was any point to it, is stuff that even if I disagree with, I think I have to take more seriously than I would teach this differently in this way, I would do this part of the course differently in this way, because there are a lot of ways in which this could be done really successfully. It's not the sort of thing that we even want to to you know, find the single best way of, of teaching. That's not necessarily a coherent idea. Very good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, Chris actually has a question. Yeah, am I uh, unmuted now? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm wondering what are some of the unique challenges of teaching first years as opposed to older college students? Mm -hmm. So, uh, like I said, the, the students that, um, that show up at Carnegie Mellon, uh, they may be in my course uh, the very first semester. And that means that um, they do not necessarily have a lot of skills that I, you can expect students later on to have. There's going to be a lot of, of um, people that I mean, there are going to be an awful lot of emotional and um, personal and, you know, every kind of difficulty. They're working out a lot of stuff at once. Um, I think that the, the primary thing that in the design of the course and the way I've changed it, we've really taken account of the fact that we're teaching first years is we've had to decrease the size of every assignment. Um, substantially. So when I when I first started teaching this course we had about uh, eight assignments um, that included both a, a written theory component and a programming uh, component. And now that I've been teaching this, I, I, I think that I can say this with a clear conscience without actually adding more total work. We now have um, uh, about 11 written assignments and I think 12 programming deadlines. Uh, the way that we change the programming deadlines is we, we, we basically split up three of the assignments um, in order to have 
um, weekly assignments that were all smaller chunks. So rather than having one assignment that you had two weeks to work on, so that you could delay until the last day and have far too much to do, we um, we required them to do a little bit of, we, we did a little bit of that time management for them. Um, because I think that um, it's the most obvious way in which most of the students we're going to deal with uh, because they're first years is absolutely just straight up time management. Um, because we're dealing with first years, there also are going to be a lot of cases, you know, a couple of cases that are dealing with some of the more serious challenges of working with um, uh, that, that arise as people start trying to live on their own. But the, the number one thing that I, I've, I've encountered is absolutely time management. And um, by splitting up deadlines and staggering, and so, you know, and staggering rather than having one big deadline a week or one big deadline, deadline every week and a half, having two deadlines a week, um, it means that the feedback I've gotten is that students feel like the course is a lot more unrelenting. There's only like two times in the course after they after the two midterms where people can take a deep breath and be like, here are two days when I don't have to do homework for my, uh, my course. Um, but that means that they're not running into what they were doing before, which was, it's midnight, I've finished my programming assignment, um, and now I have to start the written assignment that's due in eight hours. And then when I finish that at 4 a.m., I need to start working on my English paper. Um, and so that, that's sort of, uh, I, that's really been the biggest challenge. It's not that juniors magically know how to manage their time well. I'm 31 and I still don't know how to manage my time well. But I'm way better at it than I was as a freshman in college. Um, and so... Yeah. All right, great, thank you. Uh, Steve, did you want to ask the question from Dutch? Yeah, so Dutch would ask it himself, but his fan is broken down on his computer, so he's apparently touching it every once in a while to make sure it doesn't melt down. Um, so <laughs> Dutch wanted to, wanted to know, in, in, in terms of setting learning objectives, uh, how eager do you think we as educators should be to adapt to uh, adapt what we teach to our students to trends in programming languages, in software engineering, in programming tools, in industry? That is a question that very much, I think, matters where you are in the curriculum. Um, I think that in terms of thinking about, and maybe even in terms of thinking about what courses to offer, uh, we, we, te we have a number of courses that are um, uh, aimed at, you know, we, we've got a web app development class, and I think that that's really cool. I think that, that that's, you know, excellent, and I, I know that um, Kim Vol talked a little bit about this too, you know, uh, talking about, well, making sure that, that students have uh, the ability to uh, to get started on their own projects, I, I guess. I guess her particular advice was, you know, if you want to get into game design, like, be programming games, be programming games. Um, it doesn't matter if the university doesn't offer them. But in terms of, you know, maybe the university should offer that. I think at the the sophomore and the junior level, that's important. On the other hand, um, I think that in terms of the intro curriculum. Um, we should be figuring out what people need in order to understand the foundations of computer science. Um, and I don't think that there's just one foundations of computer science, but, I mean, you know, students are going to need to learn how to write imperative programs, and they're going to need they're going to need to understand what it means to do a binary search tree, and they need to understand what it means to do a linked list. And um, I, um, I think that one of the aspects of that curriculum that I drew here on the screen a little while ago is that we have made in our curriculum a pretty conscious decision to make sure that people have a lot of fundamentals first. That we're not doing a lot of, um, I mean, we try to do interesting um, 
uh, programming assignments that are fun and compelling on their own while people are working through this class. We teach arrays by doing image manipulation, and like also we teach bit like shifting by doing image manipulation. Um, we do uh, game search by doing. Uh, um, uh, or we, we do search problems by doing solving games. So we've got, um, I've got above my head a, a, a lights out board. Whoop. Uh, a, a, an old lights out board. We have them solve lights out. It's a simple computational game. Um, and I've got some peg solitaire boards because we have them do peg solitaire. That's one of the uh, assignments that we, we have them work on. So um, um, I, I, I think that and the idea, the point of that curriculum, the point of getting a lot of fundamentals of data structures and functional programming and imperative programming is that once we've once they've made it through that basic curriculum, once they've made it through that foundations, then there's a ton of places that you can go with that. Then there's a ton of directions that you can build off on that from. And many of the things that we should be doing are trying to um, explain and elaborate the connections between the fundamentals that they've then already learned and um, uh, what's actually going on in the world and in the practice of computer science. Um, so I'm, I'm um, but in terms of where I, I, I usually sit in the curriculum, um, in terms of the intro curriculum, I think that we should focus on making sure that they understand uh, the foundational principles at work. And those are, um, at, at this point in time, uh, we have a pretty clear sense, I think, uh, overall of what those fu uh, fundamentals are. Uh, they haven't. They haven't changed. They haven't been. The, you know, link lists aren't a fad, um, and so. That's a, uh, 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 I, I think it's very worthwhile to uh, make sure that that's a thing that is separate, that is its own thing. Now, again, you could disagree with the way that we uh, choose to go about things and say, really, we should be working on more of these obvious connections to jargon going on in the real world than... Um, you know, and that should be first, and then we should use that to introduce some fundamentals. And I think that that's a possibly valid argument that I happen to disagree with versus I think that there are some fundamentals, and that's kind of where I have the luxury of living in the curriculum is this place where there are a lot of really core ideas. Great. Uh, Will, can I jump in with one more question that I'm hoping to ask everybody before they escape us? Oh, yeah. All right, so, Rob, for a teacher bin, and can you tell us a little about them? Doesn't have to be computer science, doesn't have to be university level, just your favorite. Say, 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 the, say the beginning of the question again. Who's your favorite teacher that you've, uh, that you've had? Hmm... My high school physics teacher, um, almost uh, uh, was the reason I went to school for engineering and the reason that uh, I thought I wanted to be an electrical engineer uh, because I um, he was one of the first I think um, upper level I, I took an, an AP course um, from him he, he was effectively a you know my first one of my first college level professors that taught with a uh, on a whiteboard and so I'm more of a blackboard person than a whiteboard uh, person but it was this idea of sort of explaining concepts live and in an improvisational fashion in front of students um, where you have a, an idea of what you're teaching but you're not um, um, you're not uh, um, you're not actually um, you know but but you're working through that and so that was you know I, I, I thought that I wanted to be an electro engineer because I knew I liked um, math and I knew I liked computing and I, I knew I liked physics um, and I realized when I got to college that I really liked math and I really liked computing um, and I'd really really enjoyed taking Ken Gibson's physics uh, physics class, um, and um, and I don't think you know that's uh, uh, the fact that he didn't cause me to um, 
to fall in love with physics itself. I don't think, yeah, that wasn't going to be happening. That's not his fault. Um, but um, I, I think the, the the I hadn't thought about the fact that um, he was also the first um, uh, sort of college level teacher that used. Um, live drawing. I distinctly remember that one of the things that, um, I distinctly remember two things about uh, that class. One of them was my friend who was um, a, uh, an extraordinary math student and an extraordinary artist. Um, uh, Nalini uh, lamented after uh, Ken had drawn, uh, Ken Gibson had drawn some demonstration of you've got an elephant on a cliff and the elephant falls off a cliff and there's a trampoline and you've got the amount of like energy that's lost to the trampoline and he drew this in like four lines and it was very clearly an elephant falling off a cliff onto a trampoline and Nalini was like if I could draw an elephant like that man, I wouldn't be worried about getting into, you know, the, the conservatory that she was applying. He was just, he was incredible at communicating in this very, very minimal visual language. I mean, like, I mean, Picasso, right? And, um, and then the other thing was he had all of these, you know, demonstrations. And, and one of the things that he did was he had a, a DC generator that was just a, um, um, a, uh, uh, a, a, a pencil sharpener that, that generated, I guess it was AC current, um, and um, and there was a little light bulb that you could screw in, and then there were two bare electrodes, and like, you know, he had us do the thing where we, like, you could screw in the light bulb and like, you could put your your hand on the, this was probably terrible, like, but he, you know, allowed us to experiment and play around and kind of maybe get a little bit hurt in a way that probably wasn't going to kill us. Um, but, um, you know, put a lot of trust in his students. So I haven't thought about um, high school physics in a long time. That's a really great question. Thank you for asking it. You're very welcome. Um, Will, do you have any more questions? I guess uh, sort of the very last uh, question is always, you know, do you have any shout-outs or... You know, people you want to thank, or anything you want to bring attention to, or anything hmm. like that. Um, I am going to momentarily blank at this point. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, I've mentioned I, I've had a lot of fantastic um, uh, uh, mentors in teaching at Carnegie Mellon, uh, and in particular, Frank Fenning and Tom Cortina. I, I could not have uh, gotten to this place in one piece uh, without uh, without both of them. So, um, If we wanted to learn more about uh, that class that you're involved in, is, is there a website that you'd point us to, or materials online that we could find out more about? Yeah, so basically the entire, um, all the course materials are available. Uh, they're linked from my website, uh, which I think is linked from your website. Um, and so we, we keep, you know, the, the, the course materials. And I think um, uh, m many of the programming assignments are just uh, publicly available on the web. The compiler for the language that we use in the course, CNOT, is available from uh, cnot.typesafety.net. And if you... Um, if you click on any of the instances of the course, then there's always a link to that website as well. So um, yeah, most of the there's no textbook from the course. We're we're looking at consolidating our lecture notes into something that's a little bit more um, um, stable, uh, not necessarily in a book form, but in a stable form. Uh, but for now and going forward, everything about the course is available on the web. So it's uh, I'd definitely be happy to speak more specifically about that course um, uh, uh, at, with anyone that was interested. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And uh, you know, we had some really great questions from uh, the audience today also. Thank you for all your questions. and. I think we can go ahead and uh, end the broadcast now, and if people want to hang around and talk for a few minutes uh, afterwards, that would be great. All right, well, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. All right, signing off till the next time where we have a uh, guest that has not been announced yet, but <laughs> we know who we have in mind, I think. Summer vacation. <laughs>
Summer, Summer vacation. vacation makes it harder. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, and see you all next time.